majority immigrant community. We have seen how the lack of immigration uh, status increases the abuse and exploitation conditions for this sector of workers who face these abuses in the workplace and they are heightened because they are undocumented. So as we think of a just economy, it is critical for us to center the need for better working conditions for immigrants, job security, pathways to citizenship, while expanding the safety net for all immigrant communities to ensure that immigrant rights are indeed protected. Thank you so much, Allison. And, and Dita, what's top of mind for the ABI community, whether that's nationally or here in Nevada? Sure. So I think when it comes to the Asian community, we not we don't just speak one language. And lots of times the Asian community is we don't have a voice. We're always, like invisible. When we're talking about policies or issues, somehow we always get looked over like we have this thing that we're the moral minority. We have money, we're smart, and we're you know, we're rich and, and then let me explain that. That is not true. Especially last year during the pandemic, we know that is not true. But one thing that we have is we don't speak the same language. So when you have policies and issues that comes up, we have to be able to get in different languages. Just to talk about Nevada itself, the Asian population is one of the fastest growing. And when it comes to diversity, we're number three in the state. When it comes to Hawaii being first, California being second, and Nevada being number three. And when it comes to language, when we have these policies or issues, it's not in a language where we can understand. And we have over 385,000 Asian and Asian Pacific Islander in the state of Nevada. We need to address those issues that affect us just the same as everybody else. And I agree with all the issues that's been brought up. But let's not forget what makes this country with immigrant foreigners, and people who came, except for the Native American, we need to appreciate that. We will also know to know our place and where we belong to. We work really hard. Our stories have never been told. And I think having our stories being told is very important. Thank you. Indeed, thank you, Gita. So now that we have identified just some of the key issues we need to address, the, the thought is we might start moving from the what to the how. Uh, so Irene is the Chief Strategy Officer for the Workforce Development System uh, here in the state. What have you learned about both the challenges and opportunities uh, for training immigrant workers to move up uh, a career ladder? Thank you for that question. So I know that my parents were migrant farm workers and they took uh, the opportunities that were offered through the ecosystem uh, in Central California in order for myself and my siblings to be able to advance. And, and we did, and I'm grateful for that. But I still consider that probably the number one challenge is not knowing how to navigate the system in order to help your family to prosper, not only for the adults in the household, but for the young adults, the teens that are the future workforce like Mario talked about. And so that still remains a challenge. Um, there, you know, recently I came across an individual that came in um, into Las Vegas and they needed housing and food and transportation before they could get on to economic prosperity for a career pathway. And then recently there was a gentleman who just needed uh, training on some new skills to upskill his skill set to be able to be a mechanical engineer within a construction company. Both of those instances, the dollars within the local board provide for that kind of support. But the challenge is navigating the ecosystem and that takes champions that we need to develop within this community in order to get on that pathway. Thanks for that. Jafari, you've been involved in all sorts of organizing campaigns, both before going to the AFL and, and uh, now in your job is in effect one of the most powerful officers of uh, the AFL-CIO. Can you give us some examples of organizing successes that would give us some instruction about what to do in the future? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, we all know, we all have been fighting for a fair minimum wage in this country, um, and we have been struggling to get that. Uh, but a lot of workers, we even work in those wages. One of the things that we don't talk about is about this thing called wage theft. Workers go all day to work and their wages are stolen and nothing done about it. One study found that workers are robbed and estimated $8 billion income every year by their employers. And this is just in the 10 most populous states in the country. So you can imagine how much money is stolen from workers every day, every year, nationwide. And this is disastrous. Because the narrative in this country is workers, especially migrant workers, are criminals. Well, we don't talk about the actual criminals who actually steal their money every day and nothing gets done about it. So if you're an immigrant, especially an undocumented immigrant, and you know your wages are being stolen, and you want to complain about it, that's what people tell you, you should go file a complaint. Usually that leads into you being separated from your family and getting deported. I think it's high time that we change that and people who rob people get to go to jail and get to be punished even if they are employers. And that's why a group of workers here in Nevada, in Las Vegas, have been trying to do. Because some of these workers who have been speak, speaking about these violations of law have faced retaliations. And that has an effect for all workers, not only for those workers that are, uh, their wages are stolen. Led by the painters union here in Las Vegas and community organizations. The new department, they went to the new Department of Labor and asked the new Department of Labor um, To go on to, 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 to do an investigation. So the win here is the Department of Labor has asked Homeland Security, is asking Homeland Security to grant status for migrant workers who are complaining to actually get a work permit until their, their cases are examined. I think that's a huge victory for workers in, here in Nevada. And I think that's a huge victory for workers all throughout the country who are living in the shadows and who have been living in fear to actually stand up and fight for their right at the, at, at the workplace. And that is not just about migrant workers. That strengthens all workers in the country. Right. And a great lesson for all of us who are engaged in, in wage theft battles uh, across the country. Um, Mario, uh, you've talked very passionately about youth, but uh, you also represent a company that is very heavily dependent on, on immigrants. Um, can, as the only representative of a corporation on the panel, can you highlight some public-private strategies that, that some of us ought to consider? Thanks, Charles. And yes, Western Union provides services or immigrants that have left their countries in search of opportunity. Not all of our customers are immigrants, but the majority are. And you know, we strive every day to respond to their needs. When you are sending money back home to your loved ones, you are sending love. And that is my conviction, that a remittance is an act of love. Because you know that you left your 
loved ones in their home communities. And that money is essential to cover basic needs. It goes for education, for health, to take care of the elderly, to take care of the young, to start a new business. So just think about it. For us, it represents a huge responsibility because we are trusting us. And that's the feeling that I get when I send in money to my mother that is still in the Barrio del Panteón, in Tasco de Alarcón Guerrero. When I send money to her, I know that she will have money for her medicine that she needs to take every now and then and to pay for those needs and to cover basic needs. But we don't only do those business. We engage on issues that are of critical importance for the immigrant community. And we have been doing this for years. And I can tell you because I have been doing that in person, building alliances, getting to know, supporting many organizations at the international, national, state, local, and something that is very unique about the Western Union is that we work with a lot of grassroots immigrant-led organizations, like the people from Michoacan here in Nevada, like other communities where we are always involved. And we do this at every forum that we have. And you know, for example, at the international level in Mexico, Mexico is a place of transit. It's a place of origin for immigrants, but it's also increasingly a place of destination of immigrants. So we're working with organizations like Welcome in America, collaborating so that we can share the experiences and best practices so that Mexico becomes a welcoming country for the immigrants, immigrants and refugees that are deciding to stay there. So critically important is that the organizations are able to build alliances, build bridges, and work together in public, private partnerships that engage also the immigrant diaspora. Thank you for that. Um, Allison, your, your organization led the fight for the first state domestic Workers Bill of Rights really a, a pioneering achievement. How did you do that, and, and what lessons might we might we learn from that struggle? Yes, the National Domestic Workers Alliance uh, was a part of the New York Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. New York became the first state back in 2010 to win major labor protect, uh, protections for, for domestic workers, many of whom are indeed undocumented domestic workers. This was a huge win, not only for domestic workers, but for the low wage workers across the country as well. And since that win in 2010, we've gone on to win uh, similar protections in 10 other states and two cities across the country and most recently we've also launched a federal bill of rights as well for domestic workers. We were able to do this by building power at the grassroots level and I am an example of that power because at the time that I got involved I was working as a nanny in New York City and domestic workers as you can imagine work in isolation so we knew in order to win we needed to meet workers where they were at. And we're talking about the parks, the playgrounds, train stations, bus stations, in the streets. And we also needed to build alliances with individuals and communities who were impacted by care work, which essentially is all of us, right? So some of the lessons that we have learned is that it's important to invest in organizing and building the power of undocumented workers. This community is rich with knowledge, with skills, and is oftentimes ignored or left untapped. We know that we're stronger together and building across sectors to ensure our movement is stronger because all workers deserve to work with dignity. They deserve to have dignified jobs 
with proper benefits and proper protections. And immigrant women of color in particular, who are directly impacted by these issues need to be leading the work. This ensures that no one is left behind in the solutions that, that we're moving forward and we're winning together. Indeed, I think all of us um, have, have learned the, the importance of empowering uh, the people we uh, try and represent. So Vita, you've been a founder, you've built the Asian Community Development Council here literally from the ground up. Um, what lessons are, can you give us from your experience that can inform and inspire others as we try and build uh, more power uh, at the state and local level? Sure. So let me tell you, I, I started in 2015. So we're a very new organization. In the six years time, my lesson that I've learned, I've been in Las Vegas for 27 years. And when I came to Las Vegas, the reason why I came to Las Vegas was I had a nephew who was eight years old going to school he was bullied by his teacher. And the family, instead of getting help in the community, went, went to the PTA or went to the school board or to the school to ask for help, they actually got threatening phone calls, tell them to go back to their country, tell them that they don't belong here, they were farther from school, from work, and being harassed. A few months later on, my brother-in-law dies of a heart attack, leaving his eight-year-old son and 11-year-old daughter and his wife to, def to fend for herself. So 27 years ago, I came to Las Vegas to take care of the funeral arrangement. But I ended up staying because we had nowhere for our community, the Asian community, not only Asian community, but any, any community to get support or help. So even though it took me 20 years to put this nonprofit together, I've learned lessons for 20 years, how important it's to work with across all our brothers and sisters coming together. You can't do this alone. But I reach out to the other groups that's out here, that's important. But power that I learned was when we start mobilizing our community to vote. If you're a citizen, vote. Because you don't vote, you don't have a voice. If you have to talk about voting every year and when we vote, we hold our elected official accountable to help our immigrant families, because we know this country is built of immigrants. But without the power of coming together, without the power of us working together, we couldn't do what we do. So right now we have programs and things in space, but working with Silver State Voices when we do data, she brings 19 different organizations together, and we meet monthly to see how we can grow our community and how we can work together. So that's really important, that's the lesson I learned. Thank you. Thanks, amen to that. And there were some other amens from here on the panel. So we know we can make progress. Um, we know we can do it in our individual areas because you've already heard of a number of successes. But we also know that we can't build a more inclusive economy alone. So in that vein, um, Irene, let's move into the calls to action area. If you could ask Nick participants uh, to do one thing or, or more than one thing to help you make the workforce development system more responsive to immigrants, what would that be? I would ask that you guys, uh, the call to action would be to extend an invitation to myself and other team members to come and educate your community about how the local workforce system, how uh, a career pathway and training dollars are available for individuals. Uh, it belongs to them. Uh, they just need to know how to tap into it. So my call to action, work with your local board and develop that strategy to get people on an economic prosperity pathway. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. Jafari, so you're involved in so many issues and many of us work side by side with you on so many issues. What aren't we doing as pro-immigrant advocates that you would like uh, us to be doing more of or, or, or doing it all? Um, let me let you into a little bit, a little secret here. Change is not going to come from Washington, D.C. Mm. <laughs> Things go to D.C. to die, not to live. <laughs> so, we have to create a grassroots movement to achieve what we need to achieve, to get what we need to get. And in order to do that, it is going to require us 
to practice this little thing we call solidarity. And that is solidarity that we have to exercise and practice not when it's sunny outside, but when it's raining outside to stand with each other. So the why is it we have three big challenges that are facing our nation. And that is our democracy is in shambles. Our democracy is standing on one leg. And it needs all of us to make it stand strong. So last time we have updated our workplace democracy, or workplace rules, in this country is 83 years ago. That's the last time we have passed the political labor law reform in this country. And, and people say it's been a long time since we've done immigration reform, right? <laughs> That's what I was going to give you. I said three things. And we have to find a way to a pathway to citizenship. And that's why I'm saying we all have to come together. Because what politicians would like to try to do is they want to keep us busy on our one issues that we're not focused on the whole piece. So sisters and brothers, I want to tell you on behalf of the labor movement, we stand with you until we get pathway to citizenship. No excuses, no shortcuts, nothing. But that ain't gonna just happen. We have to work on it. Because, let's be honest, we have been actually going backwards instead of moving forward. Do you all remember 2012 and 2013, the euphoria we had? That's because our movement was based on the ground. I still dream of that day. I think it was in 2006, Los Angeles, when I was with millions of immigrants themselves demanding their rights. We need to go back to those days. That's what got us to, all, to almost getting what we were hoping for. By the way, in 2013, we had the votes. We just could not get Congress to actually vote to making pathway to citizenship a reality. Sisters and brothers, we can't cut corners. We have to fight for what we care about. And until we save our democracy, strengthen our workplace rights, and provide for every worker, no matter where you were born, what language you speak, what kind of accent you have, or what you look like, our job is not done, and that's what we're focused on. So, Maria, we know your company supports immigration reform, um, but that's not true of, of all uh, major companies that benefit from the work of immigrants. Do you have advice for us about what we can do to get more business support for um, immigration reform, and not just in the headlines, but you know, in the trenches where it counts. Thanks, Charles. I can tell you this, Western Union is a purpose-driven company. I live this every day because we really advocate for the immigrant community. We use every single forum that we have available to speak of and speak on behalf of immigrants and refugees at the international, national, local level, wherever we have an opportunity to speak for inclusion and for a welcoming environment, we do it. Starting with our CEO, Kidman, believe me, uh, we are not afraid to take a stand and to speak up. So what we need to do is precisely to get more participants of the private sector in this discussion. I have been in many forums with many of you in several cities discussing about immigration reform or issues that are impacting immigrants 
and tell me, uh, I will tell you that I see a lot of representatives of advocacy organizations. And when it is time to introduce somebody from the private sector, it's only a few. And so well, we need let more. Me push you on that. So I, I, I get that that's the point. That's the point. We need to build bridges. We need to start talking to this community and representatives of the private sector. So with respect, many of us do talk to them, and frankly, sometimes to our faces, and then sometimes in letters, they may support uh, where we are, but at the same time, they're supporting with their contributions or in other ways, the people are standing in the way of reform. So I'm, I'm not jamming you, I'm looking for help here. How do we get them to weigh in with their support in a way that's really going to matter. Again, it's the uh, look for allies that you have in the private sector, and Western Union is an ally. And to use the forum that we have to continue engaging in the discussion. I think that uh, what we can do is to collaborate more on this. Uh, Charles, you know, I, I mentioned to you, it would be great if we could work together. You know, the business, business roundtable identified what is the purpose of a corporation and the responsibility of a corporate corporation. And it's not only a responsibility towards the shareholders of the companies, but it's also a responsibility to the stakeholders because if you have a community that is more inclusive, that is more in equitable, it's good business, it's good for business. So we need to hammer that message and to get more representatives of the private sector engaged. Well, we certainly support that. If you can help us amplify our voices in those circles, that would be super helpful. So Allison, you've been in lots of those circles and in lots of those conversations. What do we need to do to pave the way for more victories like you've already had with the uh, Domestic Workers Bill of Rights? Thank you so much for that question. First, we need to recognize that Black immigrant lives and all Black lives matter. And it's important for us to see this as we continue throughout this conference, as we continue in our day-to-day -day work and our lives, that we need to dismantle the systems of oppression and anti-Blackness. It is also important for us to acknowledge that there are an estimated 5 million, over 5 million undocumented immigrants in this country. Many of them have spent decades in this country working as essential workers. They risk their lives and their families and their communities um, in order to keep this country running. Uh, we need to ensure that their voices and the experiences of marginalized workers are being valued and elevated. There also needs to be an investment in child care, from child care to the aging communities, and having a clear vision and a plan. We started organizing domestic workers years before the victory, and throughout the campaign, we learned the importance of having a clear vision and strategy to visualize and in a workforce to win recognition that domestic work is indeed real work and to put domestic work for organizing on the map. Throughout this campaign, we learned about the importance of situating the specific policy in larger, more expensive issues that speak to all of us. When it is important, and celebrating the victories that we win along the way is also important. Thank you. Vida, I think you're going to be the uh, wrap up speaker for the panel. How can we support you in making the economy more inclusive for API? Sure. Let me, let me talk about this conference took what 18 to 20 months to put together. This conference is for you. The months that we put together to make sure that we have a voice and we can talk about things. So I want to shout out to my team from the ACDC, the Asian Community Development Council. 
for making sure we run this smoothly. I also want to thank the people from this conference that put this together. And I want to salute you for doing this. Let's come out and think about how can we organize, think positive, moving forward. We know we're angry, we know we want changes, but we can make changes when we work together. Thank you so much. I want to please give our panelists a round of applause. Um, please give yourselves a round of applause for sticking with us. We really appreciate it.